But the thing that always stands out is they always say, your staff are amazing. And generally, even in the best experiences in the best restaurants in the world, for the layman, not for the food nerd who categorises everything. I mean, I just about remember every dish I ever ate in every restaurant ever. Yeah. But most people will forget the food. For sure. They won't forget how they were treated. Yep. Yeah. That was this week's guest, Chef Dan Hunter. And this is Conscious Conversations. Welcome. Um, if you're new, welcome. If you're not new and this year, you're a repeat listener, welcome back. But my name's Luke McLean and I'm a, a life coach and I'm a meditation teacher. And I'm really curious about people who are living a conscious and authentic life, but more importantly, people that have carved out a really successful career in doing that. And this conversation with with Dan Hunter, who you know is a world class chef in his own right, but also created a restaurant called Bray, which is a world class restaurant. And when you consider that there's you know around about five million restaurants in the world, and Dan and his wife Jules have been able to to create something that that sits in the top fifty, often the top thirty restaurants in the world, um, often the top five to three restaurants in Australia, um, it's a pretty phenomenal effort. And that's what we get into in this conversation with Dan is is the process, the clarity of vision and what's needed to develop something that's truly world class. So if you're a foodie, this is a great conversation because you know we do talk a little bit about that. But if you're into leadership, um, if you're looking to start something yourself, this is also I think a really timely conversation because we sort of get into to not it not just being about the food, but it's just about so much more. And often when we talk about creating something, it's not just the outcome of what people see, it's what happens behind the scenes and it's every little thing that needs to go together for the outcome to happen. And that's what we get into in this conversation. So I really hope you like it. If you want to get more of Dan, I think he's on Instagram at Chef Dan Hunter, or you just hit up Bray on Instagram or the or the Bray website. If you want to check out a bit more of me, it's LukeMcLean.net, um, Conscious Conversations in iTunes or, or Spotify, um, or Luke McLean Mindfulness on Instagram. But, you know, this is a really timely conversation. It's a, it's a, it's a thoughtful conversation. There's plenty of slow pauses because Dan is very thoughtful. You know, he just doesn't answer on a whim. He, you know, he took the questions in and he, he answered them as they came. So without further ado, um, this is Conscious Conversations and this is Chef Dan Hunter. Dan, thanks for coming on, mate. Really wanted to sort of d- discuss and get into this conversation, A, around how you've built, you know, a world-class restaurant, but not so much the outcome of the restaurant, but what like, what were the steps and obviously the process to get to that point and, and for you personally, but then how you sort of go from being like a really good chef to a great <laughs> chef then to actually owning a restaurant and all the, the other parts that come to that delivery of the outcome that actually gets to the plate because it's not just that. No, it's not just... Cooking the experience. <laughs> so for you, like, when did it? When did you start to really get an interest in food and an interest in that sort of the creativity and the experience of food? Um, I guess, in a funny sense, compared to maybe some of my peers, um, I probably came to cooking a little bit later than than some do. I think it's more common now that people sort of see school out and then you know have a bit of a play around and then decide their profession post that period, you know, I guess, but, you know, traditionally cooking's been one of those things, you weren't good at anything else, so you fell into cooking, yeah, you know, yeah, that, that yeah. sort of thing. And I think the industry's changed dramatically in the last, or certainly during my career, that it's now, there's a lot of smart people cooking. You yeah. know, it's not just something that you do when you you can't do something that's more academic. And I think cooking's become quite academic, you know. But anyway, I mean, I, I sort of left school and, and didn't really have a an objective, rather than to hang out with my mates and, and yep. have some fun. And uh and sort of early 20s, found myself in a kitchen one day uh, doing some cash work, washing dishes. Um, wasn't the greatest I've had in the kitchen that one, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Broke a window. Yeah. Um, you know, just about got kicked out from the from the owner. But essentially found myself within a kitchen in my early 20s yep. um, doing, doing dishwashing and, and some very basic sort of food prep after that. Um, and just really liked it, just really enjoyed uh, the fact that people could be themselves it wasn't a place where you had to be a certain academic level or you had to 
have your hair cut a certain way or, yep. you know, it's uh, you could be yourself. You sort of locked away a bit in those days, so mm. it's pretty rough back in the kitchen at times. Um, camaraderie was a big thing. I was sort of, I guess, into a lot of sport when I was, uh, you know, a teenager and team sports particularly. And um, yep. I sort of saw some comparison yeah, okay. in the, in the behaviour of, of what was going on in the workplace in, uh, I guess, front of back of house and, yep. and the team... You know, necessity to get the job done. And I really just really enjoyed those sort of aspects. And eventually, um, travelling with Jules, my wife, spent some time in the UK overseas and, and again was working in kitchens the whole time. Sort of got myself into a cooking job through just sort of basically lying at a job interview and, yeah. and stealing some books from a library <laughs> to get myself through and and, and sort of got a, a fairly, you know, it was a pretty terrible place. It was a pub, but... My role was sort of higher up in the chain, yeah. Um, and sort of got myself through about five or six months of just doing that, and realised that it was something that I was good at, and also something that interested me, you know. And upon returning to Australia at about twenty two to oh, about twenty three, um, had planned to do things properly, yeah. Um, okay, do it professionally, do an apprenticeship, do an adult apprenticeship, and sort of started started the real progression really into what I do today. From sort of that moment, and I guess entering something as an adult, you have the ability to sort of focus a bit more. Yep. Um, you do it a bit more seriously. Certainly, having a wage of two hundred bucks a week as a mature age. Yeah, for sure. Apprentice is pretty shit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you make sure you're getting the most out of it. Yeah. Um. So yeah. So basically, the last twenty two or so years have been. So when in it. that, you know they. Sometimes they talk about like you know experiences or people can really you know shape your future. In terms of like what, what was that? Was it either or was it something different that went from okay I want to do this well as though I just want to do it and get get a job and then the transition to actually I want to sort of become one of the best there is at, at how this actually looks. I've always really loved restaurants. The minute I sort of got into cooking was because I was sort of getting into eating. Yep, you know and. Um, I think all the best cooks will probably agree they prefer to be sitting in the dining room than in the kitchen. Yep. And I think that love of of being at a table with people, being in the buzz of a really busy place or, or an excellent place, it doesn't have to be busy, but yeah. it has to be, you know, excellent. I've always really enjoyed that. And, and really the minute I made the decision to go from working in a pretty average pub, washing dishes and cooking chicken curries, curries for, you yeah. know, with English recipes based behind it, to going, I want to work in a proper restaurant and do things properly and learn how to butcher an animal, learn how to break down fish, like learn the skills involved, yeah. learn how to make things taste nice. Sort of haven't really wavered from that moment. It was a very, very much a wholehearted decision back then to go pull a button on it and go, let's do this thing properly to the yeah. best of ability yeah. and see where it goes. And not knowing where that goes, yeah, either, yeah. having absolutely zero comprehension of what that means, yeah, okay. but always wanting to to do things properly, things that were within my control um, to do it at the highest possible level. Has that always been in your sort of values and purpose, even like as a kid with sport and those sorts of things? Was it to try to really get the best out of yourself in whatever you did? Yeah, certainly wasn't at school. <laughs> but um, but so, I think in, I think look to be honest, I think in friendships, I think in what you've got interest in in relationships, and yep. I think in um, uh, I played a lot of tennis to a fairly high standard yep. when I was a kid, and I guess you know when you're out in a court one on one, yeah, um, there's no one to rely on. And, and yeah, so I guess, I mean, I, you know, I used to play before school and play after yeah, school yeah. And, and do that properly for about five or six years. Um, but also chucked it in at about 16, 17, just so this is like, what's the point of this competition? Yep. And I guess that, that one-on-one competition that exists in sport to outdo another yep. sort of started to rub me the wrong way. Whereas in a kitchen, you're not out doing another. No, it's a team. And it's not competition against you, against other restaurants. It's really just against yourselves and providing experience to your, to your guests that they can't have anywhere else in the world. To be well and truly, yeah. for them to understand that there's at, no, at that moment, there's nowhere else they could have that moment, you know, so. And is that sort of, is that moment and that, 
that want for that experience for that person is that sort of the measure of success because I guess when you're in sport there's a winner and a loser it's quite definitive of the outcome but as, as you said with the the restaurant you, you you're not measuring yourself against something but there has to be a measure of today was a good day and we, we did really well yeah and I guess it's about that that thing is always I guess tied to your own standards yeah. you know and 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 reevaluating them daily and you know, pre- you know, pushing them out daily as well. Like, I mean, it's, a, it's just a bit of a funny thing, but like, you know, some of our worst days is when the most guests come in and say thanks and they can't believe it and they're all over us. And I'm always like, I almost don't want to listen to it because I'm thinking, yeah, yeah but but we had another objective today. Yeah, you for know? sure. And it was the one that we set and I don't think we got that. And it's, it's almost, it's certainly not dis- disheartening because it's obviously great to be gratified. Um, and... You know, you should always be there to make your guests happy, not just yourself. But yeah. you certainly need to set your own standards and then benchmark against yourself sometimes. And obviously, eat out around the world and benchmark against those places as well. And I guess that's not necessarily competition. That's just about that's just benchmarking, you know. So it's a funny thing. I mean, it's yeah. I mean, you have to have a a fairly high standard, and yeah. I guess you know levels of self-discipline and, and objectives that probably seem ridiculous at times and maybe they're buried right away yeah, in yeah. your own mind, but you're certainly aiming for things on days that we don't always achieve, but certainly great when we do. Yeah. And what, like, like Dan, that, there's, you know, hundreds of thousands of restaurants in the world, you know, across everywhere. It's one of those things where it's not just in Australia or it's not... Six just... million, I think there is. One of your staff Googled it once. Well, there, you <laughs> yeah. well, there you go. So there's six million. You sort of rest in that top... 50 yeah, regularly. Another, yeah. um, you know, what's the difference? Like but between a good restaurant, like an, a high-performing restaurant, and then the world-class, like as you said, you know, really key objectives and really clear outcomes. Like have you put your finger on what you guys do or what other, even when you go and research other restaurants, that they're doing that the other 10,000 that are just behind are good, but they're just not quite doing? Um, the thing that's probably key to most of the really great restaurant experience that I've had and one that we try to give to our guests is um, an experience of personality, an experience that's very unique. So, you know, of course there's 6 million restaurants in the world. 2 million of them cook, you know, classic Italian food. The other 2 million cook classic French food. The other 2 million cook classic Thai food. You know, like I said, there's... Yeah, there's boxes. There's there. boxes of, of these are developed recipes and we don't waver for those. And those are more your comfort places, places you go to have a steak and chips, you know, to have yeah. something that gives you just a simple nourishment and comfort and it's good and it's cheap often yeah. and you're happy with that, you know. Um, we don't do that. We yeah. do something where it's a celebration and not necessarily a celebration. It might not be your birthday, the celebration might just be the fact that you're in our restaurant yep. celebrating that, you know. So we try and make everything every day on some level a celebration for our guests, a party, a fiesta, you know. So yep. something that... Sorry, mate. You just drop it out. Oh, I'm good. Seems all good. Oh, that was that. That's okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess um, you know what's the difference? I don't know. It's a it's minute detail and and I guess vision for hospitality and hospitality and cooking are two very different things because you know we we always talk about the fact that I guess our menu the food that we serve is is quite creative at times. Yeah. There's certainly a lot of things that people do recognise and there's a lot of uh, nostalgia at times in terms of flavour profiles. And they might simply be just aromas of Australian native ingredients or the bush or, or things like that, things that put people in a place or yeah. remind them of a moment or whatever. And for internationals, it, it's showing them something completely new. You know? Yeah, okay. So there's all that stuff. There's, there's the detail. It's just, you know. So when you and Jules sat, sort of sat down with the vision of, of Bray, um, like what's... What's that planning look like in terms of not just the venue, but the, the, again that look and feel? Like, what was some of the key moments of, or discussions that took place to sort of this is what we're going to be, and this is what we're going to be about, and this is how we get delivered? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the key things about Bray, um, and again, it comes back to that personality thing. You know, it's it's very much based. It's a very personal project. You yeah. know, it's not it's not 
It's a board off the shelf. You're not, you're not getting the masses. You're not 400 seats or anything. No, we're 40 seats. Yeah. 